Hello, Hi Rock. Welcome to our daily devotional. Today is the last day in our series, uh, Deep, uh, Moving Beyond Shallow Spirituality, in which we track along with the Sunday sermons. Uh, moving forward from here, we're actually going to be moving into the book of Ecclesiastes for uh, several weeks this summer, basically the next five weeks. And I I'm going to mention it now, just in case I forget later, we're going to be going to a three per week format. So we're going to be posting devotionals on Monday and Wednesday and Friday uh, for the remainder of the summer. That may change uh, in late August. Uh, so today we're uh, con concluding our, our series called Deep, and we are looking specifically at the topic of becoming spiritual adults. And the passage we're looking at is Matthew chapter 10, verses 28, and then 34 through 36. So Matthew chapter 10, where we read this. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah, that's kind of hard to say thanks be to God about. Right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was like, huh, this feels like a funny thing, but okay. Yeah, well, and, and certainly uh, this passage considered in isolation really gives a different picture of Jesus, and it's important to understand it uh, in context and what kind of division Jesus is talking about here. And we'll get to that in a second. But I just want to start off by acknowledging that I think it's very rare for, for people to want conflict, or at least it's very rare for healthy people mm -hmm. to want conflict. Mm -hmm. The idea that Jesus came to bring conflict should uh, should upset us or at least get us curious about what Jesus uh, is talking about. And most of us avoid conflict. We even avoid people with whom we're in conflict. We're, uh, we often ignore problems that uh, produce conflict. We'll, we'll pretend they're not there. We'll, we'll settle for a fake peace, uh, you know, a, a truce of kinds, rather than pursuing uh, real peace oftentimes because we have to go through some kind of conflict to get there. And we're not even sure if the conflict in the end can be resolved in a way that produces peace. But a part of the, the difficulty with this, and this is something, you know, especially as adults, we need to learn to move past. Part of the challenge here is that I think most of us adults have had enough experience with this false kind of peace that we realize that, that one, it's not satisfying, it's not a real peace, but two, eventually the truth leaks out. Uh, those darker feelings that we try to suppress, uh, they're still there and they eventually leak out. Sometimes they don't just leak out, they explode out. And in the meantime, we're also bottling up our more positive emotions like affection uh, for fear of, of being hurt. And so we're, we're holding back the positive, we're trying to push down the negative, and it just doesn't, uh, just doesn't work. Um, and Jesus here says he's going to bring conflict. Why would the P Prince of Peace bring conflict into our lives. Um, I think it, it, Jesus isn't actually bringing the conflict. I think what's really happening here is Jesus is cause it, uh, uh, calling us to be truthful, and that truth is going to expose the real conflict. Um, obviously, this is not Jesus's desire, but uh, sometimes a like a physician will want to produce pain in order to produce healing rather than to let an injury or even worse a disease persist underneath the surface where it will continue to produce greater and greater damage and require even more work to remove and maybe even not be able to be removed um so i, I think about one of the most simple ways i've experienced this uh well first of all context wise jesus is saying this to people who, for whom if they were to follow jesus this is going to result in immediate conflict in their families. Uh, you can see this. I've, I've had friends who came from um, uh, Middle Eastern families uh, where they were their, their parents practiced Islam and they became believers and, and this produced conflict. I've had friends who uh, came from a Jewish heritage who, when they decided to follow Jesus, this produced incredible conflict in their families. I've had friends who were just secular and, and atheistic, their parents, and when they became believers, this produced conflict. I think especially in, in that kind of context where just the, just the desire to follow Jesus is going to bring conflict into your families, it can be very tempting for people in those situations to want to 
either not become a believer or hide the fact that they're a believer. And, and maybe there are situations where there are there's danger and they need to do that. But as much as is possible, I think Jesus wants us to be, well, I know that Jesus wants us to be honest and to be a light for Jesus in, in an otherwise dark world. And that by its very nature is going to produce conflict. When the light enters in, the darkness is going to push back. Uh, one more thing about conflict, a friend of mine and, and I, uh, this guy Bob and I used to have these Saturday morning uh, breakfast, uh, like we sit around eating bagels and talk theology and things like that. And one day the question we were talking about was whether or not there would be conflict in heaven. And my immediate response was, no, of course not. Uh, heaven's going to be a place of peace. And Bob's position was that actually he thought there would be conflict. He said, as long as there are two individuals that have two different wills, they both even love all good things, but there's maybe a different priority to some of those good things. Just the fact that there are two different wills, there are going to be some type of conflict. He says, I think the difference is that in heaven, conflict won't be a negative thing. It, it will be a way that we get to know each other better. It'll be a way that we can love each other, and it won't produce the pain and kind, the kind of pain and damage we experience now. That maybe what's wrong with conflict is because we're broken people, and so we handle conflict in broken ways. And the more we discuss this, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, I think, I think Bob is right. I think there will be conflict in heaven. Um, the difference will be, it won't be a curse. It will be a blessing because we will be, have been so transformed as, uh, as to turn even something like difference into a way that we can love each other more. Uh, Dave, I'm wondering what you see in today's passage. Well, as we referenced earlier, I think these passages, you just read them here without any kind of context or uh, anything like that. they I, they kind of feel like a little bit of a, a, a punch in the nose, uh, right? They're just, they're they're pretty harsh. Um, but in one sense, I think especially the first section is a, probably a very important counterbalance to the more common perspective I hear these days. Uh, I think one of the things that has been really great over the last, I don't know exactly when it started, but 30 years at least, maybe 50 years, uh, there's been a, a strong emphasis on the love and grace of God. Uh, and, you know, just that has been allowed for a, a triumph over a spirit of legalism and fear and control uh, that is too often involved in human interactions, including religion. Um, so I think it's great that we've been emphasizing that, but I think we've emphasized it exclusively. And so that we end up getting a distorted picture of God, every bit as distorted as the, you know, harsh disciplinarian tyrant God, right? Both of those are distorted pictures. Uh, but now what we think we end up with this is this, oh, God's like a, a kind of just a big, like a fuzzy grandpa who just loves you so much. And he'll just, oh, it doesn't matter what you do. He's just so excited about you. He'll overlook any sin. He doesn't care, which I don't think is true. Right. There's yes, God, when, when Jesus comes, we're told that he, he comes full of the father, which is to say, in John one, full of grace and truth. And so I look at this and realize that, hey, we get so fearful, the people who can affect our, our bodies, our lives, our livelihoods. But but Jesus is saying that those people are nothing. The one you should actually be concerned with is God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And you think, well, what? God wouldn't want to do that, right? No, God doesn't want to do that. And so God showed you a pathway so that that doesn't have to happen. But God is not saying he would never do that, right? God's saying he does not want that for you because he's so full of grace. He's wanting this other pathway for you. He's wanting the second and 10th and 70th chance. He's wanting that for you. Uh, in fact, this coming Sunday, I'm going to be preaching on Jeremiah 29. And we, you know, we hear this, I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you hope in a future. But the whole context of that passage is, it, it's, you know, a lot of you say, oh, I see God's going to take care of me no matter what. God's got this good stuff for me. No, that is not what that passage is saying. What that passage is saying is, yeah, I want all this stuff for you but you're about to screw it up. You're going to miss all those good things I'm planning because you're not obeying, you're not trusting, you're resisting me. And so you think you're working out for yourself. You're actually hurting yourself. And I think that's the spirit in which I'm reading this uh, this section here from Matthew that, that God is actually, or Jesus is saying that we ought to 
take seriously the fact that, that God, he, he, somebody else kills you, whatever. This life is going to be short anyway. Eternity, and that's long. What a, a, a colossal error to sacrifice eternity for the sake of a moment, right? Eternity for the sake of the temporary. And that's what, what I think Jesus is warning us about. And I think we need to take that seriously, that yes, God is full of grace. Everything you've heard about that is true, true, true. And it's not the whole truth because God is both great and truth. God cares about these things very deeply as an expression of love, right? He wants us to truly flourish. Uh, so anyway, that's what I read in that first part. The second part, picking up kind of what you were saying there, uh, he, he did come to bring peace, but in like true peace. And this is where we've talked many times about the fact that it's not blessed with the peaceful, Right, and Jesus says in the Beatitudes, or blessed are the peace lovers. It's blessed are the peacemakers. And almost always, and we see this in Jesus himself, in order to be a peacemaker, we have to be willing to disrupt the pretense of peace. We have to be willing to have hard conversations and willing to say honest things. Um, I've got one friend, every time that she's in a conflict, just it doesn't matter who's right or who's wrong. She just apologize, 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 apologize. And, and I, I, I say, well, on one sense, I love that humility. But on the other side, I'm like, no, there, there's a place for truth here, mm -hmm. right? So that there could actually be long-term peace. Because what you're doing is perpetuating the lack of real peace by covering it over. And so I think that that's what, what part of what Jesus is telling us is, hey, we've got to be able to speak the truth. And in fact, you know, I, as I see this, uh, he says, I came to bring the sword. Well, that sounds like I'm going to kill people with it. Uh, maybe not. Maybe what I'm going to do is kill lies with it, right? Because it's, we, we, Hebrews 4 uh, says that the word of God is like a sword, right? It's the sharpest sword that divides, you know, between joints and marrow, between soul and spirit. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then in fact, it reveals men's hearts. And I think that's what happens. It gets down to the truth. It cuts through all the baloney that's in the way. Uh, it cuts through all of our, our kind of like obfuscations and lies so that we can get to the truth. Jesus is going to bring the sword, not that kills. It's the sword that cuts us free. And I think that's the, the real hope here. But it takes a lot of courage to be able to do that because there is going to be a cost. People will <laughs> threaten us. In various ways, right? And here he said in verse 28, you know, kill the body, but it's they'll kill your they'll kill your reputation or they'll kill your comfort. They'll do a lot of things to you. It's gonna take courage to stand for honesty and truth, to have real confrontation. But that is the pathway to real enduring peace. And that's gonna sometimes sadly produce divisions within our families. And, and I'll say for me as a personal testimony, um, Pushing through that, it, it's actually led to a greater peace in our families. Uh, and, you know, even I'd say for my own dad, who like really looked down on my faith at first, uh, later on coming around to see the changes that it produced me and helped lead him back into faith as well. And he's going to church every week. He's active part of church and everything. He's discovering all these things that I've been trying to tell him for years, <laughs> but it's finally happening. So better late than never. There you go. Good for you. Thanks be to God. Hey, John, will you pray for us? Yeah, I'd love to. Our good and gracious God, we thank you that you love us enough to not settle for a false peace, that you come to bring us the truth, uh, a truth that is like a sword that divides, divides right from wrong, truth from error, helps us to see the way forward. Lord, I thank you that you love us enough to give us the truth and grace. Lord, we thank you for this calling and help us to be courageous and compassionate in how we, how and when we bring the truth to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Friends, thank you for joining us through this whole series. I hope you have found it really life-giving. Uh, as Pastor John said, we're going to be starting a new sermon series this Sunday on politics. I'm not sure what to make of the fact that John chose to then study Ecclesiastes as a part of that. Which most famous line is meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. Anyway, I hope you'll join us back there. It really is so much rich wisdom in Ecclesiastes, and we're going to learn from it together going into our, our three times a week format starting this summer. We'll see you on Monday.